The Gardner Magic Quadrant for BI and Analytics Platforms 2023 Revealed. Yeah, you know, Ryan, I'm so excited for today's show because the Magic Quadrant comes out every year and, you know, people look at it, but I think it needs some more context and it needs some more explanation. And in today's episode, that's exactly what we plan on doing. Absolutely. It's kind of like uh, BI Nerd Christmas in a way. Now, the question <laughs> is, do you like the present you're unwrapping or not? <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess it depends uh, on what tool you're using. Yeah. And I've had some people come to me and say that they really expect some like spicy flame throwing takes out of this one. And um, there'll be some of that for sure. But I think what you'll see over the course of this presentation is that Gartner's view of the market is evolving in a way that I actually kind of agree with in a lot of ways. So we will get into it today. Um, I see a lot of people piling in. If you're in the chat, let us know uh, where you're calling in from. Joe Reese, friend of the show. We love Joe here at uh, Super Data Show. Good to see you, Joe. Um, all right, so we're gonna dive right into it with an overview of the Magic Quadrant. Remember to get your opinions, feedback, and reactions down mm -hmm. into the chat. This is a live show, so we try to uh, keep it keep it lively for you. All mm -hmm. right. What, what about the giveaway, Ryan? Oh yeah, that's right, the giveaway. So uh, make sure that you go ahead if you want to win a Super Data Brothers shirt, the rare, coveted Super Data shirt. You need to go to and watch us on YouTube and type into the YouTube chat, hashtag Super Data Brothers, one word, hashtag yep. Super Data Brothers. Super Data Brothers. We'll enter you into the raffle. Has to be on YouTube though. Has to be on YouTube, that's the rule. Gotta feed that algorithm. All right. We got a lot of people calling in uh, who, oh, wow. uh, yeah. who we know. Yeah, great to see everybody here today. All right, so should we jump into it? Let's jump into it. All right, let's go. Super Data Show. This is the bonus show. Uh, normally we broadcast on Thursdays at noon, today, Tuesdays at noon, because we wanted to get this one out quick. Yep. Uh, and that is the Gartner MQ for Business Intelligence and Analytics Platforms 2023. So what are we going to talk about today on the 2023 MQ Boogaloo? Uh, we're, first, we're going to talk about how not to read the Magic Quadrant. Okay, <laughs> it's important uh, to note that. We'll talk about what drives it a little bit. We'll get into the comparison 2022 versus 2023. Our key findings and analysis, what do we think are the important takeaways from this report and what does it portend for the future? We'll do a few vendor deep dives, maybe some vendor feedback rapid fire, talk about the vendors that you guys want yep. to hear about, and then we'll do a t-shirt giveaway. Yep, and if you have any comments, or if you want us to talk about a vendor or want to know our opinion on where a vendor is placed, just go ahead and let us know in the comments. Absolutely. So. Yep. And the shirt giveaway is at the end, so you can stick around to the end for the shirt. Stick around to the end. Um, so how not to read the MQ? I made this uh, sample magic quadrant graphic for you. Beautiful. Uh, and this is really gets to uh, how, what do people, they have a tendency, first of all, they, they just look at the people in the leaders quadrant and they think, well, these are obviously the best. And so those are the only ones we should consider. And then they tend to think of these axes as like the, the Y axis is how popular is the tool or its sales, and the X axis is like how good is the tool, right? And so obviously, if you're in the upper right hand quadrant, you're both very popular and very good. Uh, and that is not how to read this report, okay? Um, so how should you read it? Well, Gardner actually has a, a tip in here they say you should not ascribe your own definitions to completeness of vision or ability to execute. Uh, the, the methodology uses a range of criteria to determine the positioning as shown in the, by the evalu evaluation criteria. So this is a quote I, I pulled from the report. And so the first step in reading the report is first of all, to understand that, that this image is not the end all be all of the report, that there's a lot to learn by reading it. So if you're interested in the report, the first step to reading the report is read the report. Okay. Yeah. And, and how do you get the report? Uh, just Google it. <laughs> Google it. So, um, Google it. yeah, there are lots of vendors that have it available for download. Lots of people have it available for download. That's how I got it. I just Googled Magic Quadrant 2023. I picked from one of the vendors that popped up. I downloaded it and, and I read the report. And I read every single word of this report. So, um, so we will be, be and, diving and deep into it. I skimmed it. it. <laughs> right. Um, so 
they have a description and i'm not going to read through these but you should know what these things actually mean right like niche player first of all if you're a niche player you know only 20 tools make the cut there are hundreds or maybe i wouldn't be surprised if there's over Thousands. a thousand oh yeah bi tools of all different sizes all different stages addressing all sorts of markets general markets specialist markets right and so being in a neat the niche player in the magic quadrant means you're from gartner's perspective one of the top 20 tools in the world okay so you should consider if you are looking to acquire a new bi tool it is entirely possible that the 19th ranked bi tool as a, as as determined by gartner is the tool for you uh they're still in the top you know less than one percent of tools that yeah. exist yeah vendors if a vendor is in the magic quadrant for the first time and it's in the niche players they're happy just to be on the magic quadrant oh they're thrilled <laughs> yeah B believe me um, just look at their social media they'll be bragging about it they will be absolutely and so so niche player being a niche player being a visionary a challenger does not mean that a tool is not the right tool for you okay and then Gartner provides these definitions of what the axes actually mean. I suggest you look at these because it's not just like how good is the tool, right? The completeness of vision is not just how many features does it have. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it encompasses the, the, like what the tool can do today, where they're trying to bring it, its overall strategy, which part of the market it's seeking to address, how they're addressing it, how innovative is it? It's it's really a lot of things that Gartner takes into account, not just you know, we took a look at the features and this tool's got a lot of features, which is how people tend to interpret that that x-axis, right? Versus you know, the y-axis, the ability to execute is like, well, how good, you know, people interpret it as like how <laughs> popular is the tool? But actually, it's it's a lot of a lot of factors that that add up. So I would actually read these things. And if you read the report, Gartner will not only tell you what these are, they will tell you the market, the weighting of each of these in where someone is located on the quadrant. Yeah, just just the just the picture of the quadrant itself doesn't give you the whole picture. Right? No, especially if you're trying to choose a tool, because if you look at the in-depth description, you might see something that actually matters to you. You know, a niche player could have something that's very important to you. They absolutely will, right? And I think we'll see that when we talk about at least one of the niche players today um, has, you know, it, the reason they're niche is because there's a very specific set of, of needs and circumstances. And if you meet those needs, this is probably the best tool for you versus, you know, a Power BI or a Tableau, right? So it really, you really need to read the report. Now, of course, um, I, read the report so you don't have to to some degree mike norris friend of the show the picture that needs more than a thousand words this is a long report it's, yes <laughs> much more than a thousand words and you know what's funny about it i was reading through it the other day and i'm going through and i was reading the entry on click right so that's q so i'm i was like oh, i must be almost done i'm on the q i'm on the q section of the report and i look i'm not even halfway through mm -hmm. so <laughs> analytics platforms have a strong bias towards the end of the alphabet with how they're named um, so my pro tip is if you're creating a new analytics platform, give it a name that starts with an A and you'll always mm -hmm. be at the top of the report. All right. So here right. we have it. The big reveal. The big reveal. Next, uh, the 2022 you see on the left, 2023 so, you see like on one the of those, right. One of those cross-eyed things, you cross your eyes and you'll see an image come out. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's exactly those magic eye things. Because they the are movies. very similar. They're like a magic eye thing because they, they're, they're very similar looking. Yeah, and, and one thing that I heard, I've heard people say right away is like, well, there was really no change from last year. And I think that that is a leader's quadrant bias, right? If you look at it, you know, the positioning in the leader's quadrant changed a little bit, but the three companies in the leader's quadrant did not change. And so right away, if all you're doing is what we, again, we say not to do, which is just look at the leader's quadrant and don't read the report, then yeah, your takeaway would be, eh, nothing changed. Now, I actually created this graphic, which, um, which I'll, I'll post to LinkedIn, LinkedIn after the show so you can have uh, the ability to reference it. But what I did is I laid the two over top of one another, and then I... I put it, these red arrows on here. So the way to read this is the, the arrows origin point is where the dot was for that company last year. And then of course it, you know, it points to where the company is located today. So when you do this, you can see 
there really was quite a bit of movement in this year's quadrant compared to last year, even in the leaders quadrant. Like I would say everyone in the leaders quadrant actually got marked down a little bit. Yeah, Their positioning is worse than it was last year. They're all still the leaders, yeah. but the position is worse. I wonder if that's worse. a sign of, maybe it's a sign of quadrants to come. Oh, that's something we're going to delve into here in a second, right? So what do we what do we think this means? We'll get into that later in the show, and we have some 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 opinions on that for sure. Um, you can see good data is chilling. So why didn't good data move? Brent asks. That's a good point. Good data is the the new company this year. Yep. So MQ at a glance, uh, what 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 happened? Uh, well, first of all, they cleared out niche players. Like a lot of people moved. You can see the niche players was much more crowded last year and they moved a lot of people out of niche players. And I think that is actually a sign of things to come that there is some, some marketing uh, change coming on. Now, Yellowfin, who's been on the quadrant for a while, dropped out and Good Data is the new entrant. So that's why Good Data doesn't have an arrow is because they're new this year. Um, and and we'll, we're gonna talk about Good Data a little bit over the course of this. It's interesting to look at who's new and why they're new. Like what what does the newbie mean, right? Because there must be, they must bring something that Gartner thinks is important uh, in order to be included this year. So we'll talk about Good Data in, in that in that regard. Now the biggest gainer is Pyramid Analytics. Look at, you look at where did they go from, okay? They really were buried pretty deep in the niche players, and now they're in the visionaries quadrant. And that arrow, you can see the longest arrow moving in the positive direction is Pyramid. They, they were the biggest gainer. Um, and the biggest loser is actually SciSense. So SciSense was positioned pretty far to the right in visionaries and has moved substantially to the left in terms of their completeness of vision no longer aligns with uh, Gartner's vision of the market as strongly as it did last year. Um, and they took kind of a step down in ability to execute. So if you were to look at kind of big winners and big losers, obviously the people who are perpetually in the leaders quadrant are ultimately the winners of this quadrant every year, as long as they're there. But you know, the biggest gainer is Pyramid and the biggest loser is SciSense. One thing I wanna point out that I think will be very interesting to people that they, um, that uh, that they won't expect is that Oracle actually has the second highest score for completeness of vision. Uh, and I didn't expect that either. I was surprised by it, but you know, I went to the Gartner conference this year and um, uh, I know some people at Oracle, for, full disclosure, I worked at Oracle on the analytics pre-sales team for about nine months back in 2015. Um, and so I still know a few people there. Um, and I know a lot about what their product portfolio was like six years ago, seven years ago, obviously as an employee. And now I can, I compare that to what they showed me at the Gartner conference. And I was really pleasantly surprised at kind of the breadth of the offering that Oracle had and some of the capabilities that they had integrated into it. It is, it was well beyond what I expected from what you might consider a big lumbering enterprise or a uh, legacy enterprise vendor. Um, and then I, I have a just, I'm curious in the chat what people have to say. So look at these where Alibaba and Amazon Web Services are located, okay? Last year they were niche players. Now they are in the challengers quadrant, but they took a huge step to the left in terms of completeness of vision, like a huge downgrade in completeness of vision. So my question for you is, is this better or worse? Is it because you, you know, People think of the niche player as the worst quadrant. If you move into the challengers, but your completeness of vision takes a giant step back, did you improve your positioning on this quadrant? I don't know. What do you think, Eric? Um, maybe. Well, a lot of people moved into a lot of people moved into challengers. Right. Right. A lot of people moved into challengers. So I think, you know, maybe it's just that the. Um, I think that the the grading changed and you know because the, the market is moving and Gartner sees that so like maybe the the tool I mean obviously the tool didn't get worse right no their um completeness of vision for what it's not like the tool got worse in a year but like what counts as visionary maybe has evolved and now 
their trajectory doesn't look like they're gonna hit it as much. Yeah, yeah, and I just, like, I just, again, this is one of those things, if you just look at the image, you would say, I think most people would say, you'd rather be in the challenger's quadrant than the niche players. But, you know, this is one of those cases where AWS is now in the challenger's quadrant, that's good, yeah. but their completeness of vision is way lower than what Gartner felt it was last year, and that's bad. And so that's why, like, I really, the image itself, I think honestly does a degree of disservice to the to Gartner's research because the image can't capture the richness of the research that Gartner has done, you know? And this is this encapsulates it. Where like is this good? Is this bad? You know, like the, I don't know what to tell you uh, other than, you know, I think from a marketing perspective, you'd rather call yourself a challenger than a niche player, but I think that this is actually a step back in a way for these yeah. two for these two companies. Yeah, well, I mean, they didn't. Yeah, I guess you want to move right and up. Right, <laughs> not just right. up. <laughs> right, yeah, not just up. Right. Um, so, so that's kind of just the overlay and and you know who what what the big um, changes are from last year. You know. Uh, it shows the gaps between the challengers. Chris says, um, you know, shows the gaps between the challengers and leaders, maybe a motivator for the challengers to step up their game and develop a more complete vision, right? Because if you're in that quadrant, I guess what Gartner is saying is like, for what you do, you do it well, but you're not addressing enough of the total analytics and BI platform use cases that exist out there in order to be considered a leader. Um, there are a lot of different, uh, a lot of different comments coming in. Yeah. This is an interesting one, right? The MQ is an executive summary of the companies. It's not about a product, right? Um, and then the critical capabilities report came out today and addresses the product capabilities and use cases. And I actually, I will say the magic quadrant gets more press, but I think the critical capabilities report is, is the better, I don't, wouldn't say better, but from my perspective as someone who is really interested in the tools and the capabilities of the tools themselves, I prefer that report to the magic quadrant, but the magic quadrant has the image and the image makes it so easy to just look at the yeah. picture and, and make your make your opinions based on the picture. Yeah, look at the top right and then just don't think of anything else, right? No. <laughs> right, right. Um, here, uh, Solomon, Solomon Khan says, being niche isn't bad if you're trying to be niche. And for most companies, someone that nails the niche they're in is probably the best option, 100%. A hundred percent. And I think um, I know a lot about two of these tools that we have in the niche quadrant this year in Corda and Good Data. I, I have worked with them in the past or work with them currently. I've used them, you know, uh, and I, and they both address their niche use cases extraordinarily well. And if you have one of those use cases, I would advocate you choose one of these tools. Um, all right. So Top takeaways. I, I, um, you know, I thought about just popping open the report. I, I, I wrote so many notes on this report, and we thought about just popping it open and like going down point by point and what's good and what's bad. Um, I don't know that Gardner would appreciate that. <laughs> no. So we're going to summarize our top takeaways from the reports, and then talk about which vendors did good and bad in these takeaways, and then we'll do kind of a, some vendor deep dives at the end and give away that shirt. So. First of all, I, uh, the top takeaways in my, in our opinion here at the Super Data Brothers show. Now, this is kind of this is where you get our take on it laid on. So this is a bit of editorializing. This is not Gartner's take. This is our take on Gartner. Okay. There's a big shape shakeup coming in the MQ next year. Mm, maybe I don't know. I think it's happening. Um, this cloud platform and business app advantage is something we're going to talk about. The return of governance and the semantic layer. NLQ and NLG everywhere. And then there's this kind of bundle of things, action frameworks, modern triggers, and app builders. And then community gets a shout out in the report. That's something that I really appreciated looking at at this year's report. So we're gonna go through all of these in the next 10, 15 minutes, okay? The shakeup incoming. I think clearing out the niche players and moving many companies to the left, including the leaders, moving them down a little bit is a sign that Gartner's vision of BI is changing. Okay. And so I pulled a couple quotes from it. Um, and, and, and there's a few quotes from the report we're going to talk about over the next few minutes that I think really 
are a sign of things to come. So here's one. For several years, the Magic Quadrant has emphasized visual self-service for end users, augmented by AI to deliver automated insights. While this remains a significant use case, the platform, the market will increasingly need to focus on the needs of the analytic consumer and business decision maker, and not just the person building the visualizations. Okay, that is a huge change, and will represent a huge change from where the market has been since 2016, which is when we had our last giant market shakeup, when Cognos and SAP and Oracle all fell out of the leaders quadrant. Okay, IBM, not Cognos, IBM. SAP, Oracle all fell out of the leaders quadrant. That was because of this narrowing focus on kind of the Tableau tool set, which is mm -hmm. how quickly can someone build great looking visualizations, okay? They're saying that that is shifting in this quote. Here's the second quote. Other key market trends, including the need for improved governance of analytic content creation and dissemination, and the demand for a headless open architecture, a headless ABI platform that decouples the metric store from the front end presentation layer, enabling interoperability. This is another thing that has gone by the wayside in the last, you know, six, seven years with yeah. that like, focus on the Tableau Power BI features set to the exclusion of things like governance, interoperability, that sort of thing. Yeah, up until this year, it's basically been focusing on the Magic Quadrant has been basically front-end viz, or at least it seems like that. That's how it's felt. It really has. That that is the key differentiator. Your front-end viz capability is what sets you apart as a leader, and that all the other critical capabilities were important, but not not enough to overcome weaknesses in, in that viz building experience. That was the prime experience in, in my reading of Gartner, okay? Um, we've got this comment from Brent here. Can't wait until Gartner drives the BI company product conversation towards data ops and data as a product. Brent, I agree with you 100%. And I honestly think that that this is kind of the the start of that uh, is is with some of these quotes and, and movement you see in this magic quadrant this year. And I, for one, welcome it uh, because that's the direction I think the market needs to move in. Um, they added three new critical capabilities. So, so the critical capabilities are kind of are the things that they believe all tools need to have or should possess to some degree. Um, and so, the three new ones are metric store collaboration and data science integration. And I I think all three of these are really important, especially metric store and collaboration. Now, I I accept I accepted this whole quote, but I, I just want to read this one one part of it to you. Okay, this is so key to me. Um, ABI platforms have always been about measurement for decades. The slicing and dicing of measures by their dimensional attributes was synonymous with the act of performing business intelligence. However, over the last decade, the focus on metrics and measurement was overshadowed by data visualization. As data visualization became the most conspicuous capability, some business executives began to conflate analytics and business intelligence platforms with data visualization as if ABI platforms are glorified chart wizards. This misconception minimizes much of the work performed and the business de value delivered by ABI platforms. And I would add on by ABI teams, okay? Mm -hmm. This, these few sentences, I think, portend a big shift in Gartner's view of this market, okay? Um, it's, it is, and, and, and let's be honest here. This is, who, this was yeah. a self-reinforcing feedback loop that Gartner had a big part in driving. Yeah, I mean, the big, the big shakeup of uh, 2016, right, was basically, this, we're not focusing on any of the metric layer stuff at all. Mm -hmm. It's about front end viz and doing it quickly. Exactly. And that and who are the leaders today? It's the leaders in leaders. Yep. churning out great looking visualizations. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, th there's a shakeup coming. I'm sure of it. Gar now, nobody Gardner's told me that. I'm just I'm applying my market knowledge, my experience and looking at the message and coming out of Gartner and where I think the market is going and where I, I am reading sometimes between the lines, but this is not reading between the lines. This is reading the lines, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? It's true. This focus on visualization 
above, above all else has driven the market in a certain direction and now the correction is coming right mm -hmm. uh, and and i think gartner sees it i see it i believe and and i i'm really i'm all for it as someone who you know recognizes the value of metrics layers and data reproducibility and that sort of stuff now the way we're going to do it in the future is going to be different than how we did it in the cognos bob j days right it's going to be different the technology will be different the approaches will be different the philosophy will be different yeah. but some of those ideas are coming back and this yeah. is this is gartner telling us that but re regardless of how we do it, we're going to be moving away from the the night of a thousand tables yes right? we have to we have to um so well this is the last piece on the shakeup that i think is coming uh and i think it will be reflected in the image soon next year maybe i don't know but it's coming all of the new capa critical capabilities go against the ethos of churning out dashboards, okay? So is it 2015 all over again? We think yes. Um, and this is an important message if you're on a BI team right now. I want you to hear this. If you're on a BI team that is churning out Tableau dashboards built on Snowflake views, that is the equivalent of being on a BI team churning out Cognos reports built on Oracle Exadata in 2014. Yep. Okay. If you don't pay if you're not paying if you don't pay attention to this change that's coming, like you'll be blindsided, like so many BI teams were. Correct. Over the past, you know, they were eight years ago, and all of a sudden they figure out their their organization is using Tableau and three other BI tools, and they were completely unaware of it. And then we watched that happen. It happened at my clients. It happened where I was working. Right. That's just that is it, there is a change coming, and and um and so if what you're doing is you've got 2,500 Tableau dashboards built on 2,500 Snowflake views, like these market forces are going to make that way of working obsolete, okay? I believe. And so, you know, there's a new theory of analytics value, a new focus on ROI, scale, and governance that's gonna give advantages to new tools. And so like the final point, expect a big shakeup next year. I think, I think it'll happen next year again. No idea, no inside knowledge, no insight from Gartner that that's what they're thinking. I'm just reading what they're saying and applying my knowledge of what's happening and what I'm hearing out there in the marketplace and the data conversation today. And I think Gartner is starting to recognize this shift and will recognize it in a big way, I predict on next year's Magic Quadrant, but if not, then soon. A lot of great comments. Um, you know, there was a question, why would anybody want a, a headless, uh, semantic layer and then the response from from jonah here any company that wants what airbnb did with their semantic layer is demanding headless open architecture i do think that that is going to be an important component of the future as we'll see coming up here all right so what what are the other big takeaways the, okay here's this question mark our platform player is going to dominate the bi space so there's a consistent message in this report that bundling bi with your cloud platform or your bedrock business apps is a huge market advantage Okay, so what is that? Microsoft, Google, and AWS. And then to a lesser extent, SAP, Oracle, and I threw sort of Salesforce on here. Basically the, hey, you know, you're already, this, this is the Power yeah. BI sales play. You know, you're already cutting us this big check for all this stuff. No. Let's just make the check a little bigger well, for your Power the, BI piece. Power BI is basically free. It's Azure basically not. free. <laughs> right. Azure's not, but Power BI is. Yeah. Exactly. And so, um, and so there's, there's just this, there's, and I think Gartner, again, is not saying that this is a good thing. They're saying they're recognizing that tools that bundle with either your cloud utility, you might think of it as a utility provider. So, you know, your BI tools that are just part of your cloud platform or that ship with bundled pre-builts for your, you know, Oracle CRM, you know, or your, you know, whatever it is you're using, your Salesforce, that they have a market advantage. And I think that's true. That's just true, especially in the enterprise space. You know, that's how they sell. That's a big part of their go-to market strategy. When I was at Oracle, back in the day, we sell bundled um, OBIEE pre-built warehouses to people who had our, you know, who had PeopleSoft, for example. And that was a big way that Oracle sold BI back in the day. And so there's just this undeniable built-in advantages to these firms. And, and 
Now, here's my take on it, though, is like these pre-builds are rarely as useful. They're easy to buy, but in my experience, they're just not as useful as you think. You end up customizing them. And then because these most of these platforms are not built with the kind of an analytics as code, headless, composable architecture, what happens when you, you inevitably need to customize your, your pre-build? Well, now the code no longer matches up. So when a new version of your pre-built warehouse with your pre-built BI comes out, from your vendor, it breaks your customizations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just not in the long run that the pre-built app I find you inevitably customize, and then you've decoupled it from what the vendor provides, and now you're in a doubly bad situation. And also, I, my concern is just like the dominance by platform vendors will stifle innovation because their incentive is not to build amazing BI products. It is to funnel your compute onto their cloud onto platform. Onto the cloud. Yep. Right. Yep. Power BI sells, yeah, Microsoft sells you Power BI, but they make their money in Azure. Yeah. Um, here's a, a quote from a friend of the show, Seth Hickey. The paradigm shift to self-service with business partners, users was great, but the lack of governance and transparency of what's being created has made so much noise that nothing can be heard. Um, and possibly what's being heard isn't correct. Uh, that is 100% yep. true, Seth. Spot on, Seth. Um, okay, so the platform players, will they dominate the market? I hope not, but they do have this market advantage that Gartner recognizes. And I think Gartner is agnostic, like they're not saying it's good in this report, but they're just recognizing the state of the market. And if you're one of these big bundlers, you have a market advantage. So the next thing that I pulled out of the report is the return of governance in the semantic layer. And this slide, if you watched our previous episode, uh, not not the you know a couple weeks ago, about my experience at the Gartner and Data Analytics Conference in Orlando, we talked about this. Gartner, one of the ways that they so there's this 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 move towards more governance, semantics, right, composability, headless architectures. Well. How do we do this? This might be viewed, and I've heard people say, isn't this just centralizing BI all over again? Aren't we just going to repeat the mistakes of centralized BI? And um, Gardner's take on that is, is what you see here. They call the franchise model of data and analytics, where you have kind of the centralized provision of metrics and the centralized maintenance of the platform. But then the franchises or the business units or the domains, if you're a data mesh person, which I, I'm a huge data mesh fan, so that's how I like to think about this, but um, they run at their own speed, but they use the centrally provisioned metrics and tooling in order to help enable that, right? So that's Gartner's take on this set of capabilities, and I support this wholeheartedly. So this governance and semantics, it's the end of this, what we call here at the Super Data Show, the supply chain era of analytics where you're just churning out dashboards and that's all you care about. Build the views, you know, mm -hmm. and you've got a view that feeds the quarterly dashboard and a different view that feeds the monthly dashboard and, you know, all that sort of stuff. You can't build the analytics franchise with 2,500 views feeding 2,500 dashboards. So, but how do we avoid these mistakes of the past where, where agility and speed was crushed by centralization? You take that data mesh meshy approach. You have the headless semantic layer versus the proprietary semantic layer. So that would be the difference between, you know, um, a good data, for example, or an at scale, which has an open headless semantic layer where lots of different, even competing BI tools can use the metrics from good data. Um, and then you, you decentralize the centralize. In other words, you need to develop this circulatory or circular feedback loop between your central practice and the decentralized satellites or domains where what they do helps drive metrics quality, helps identify the useful enterprise metrics and that sort of thing. There's just so much heartburn over data quality issues that were caused by this supply chain of analytics, endless focus on churning out dashboards that the current leaders quadrant embodies. That's gotta change. And I think the leaders quadrant is gonna get a big shape, shake up in the next few years. Okay, who are the winners called out in this report? for these, for the return of governance and semantics layers. The two that were explicitly called out are good data and Domo, I think for, for enabling this. Um, and then the two that were, were called out as, the ones that were called out as the losers, or who, who just, they were specifically said, they're not as good at, at the modern governance 
uh, and and the semantic layer was QuickSight, Microsoft, SciSense, Tellius, and I I just threw in Tableau because <laughs> um, they're not. Um, and so yeah, you know, the current leaders don't reflect this shift yet. So I think we're on the, we're on the precipice of that change. And mm -hmm. I would say that Gartner is the, if you read the report, they're saying that this is increasingly important and will be very important in the future. But it's not currently the center of gravity for the report itself. And that's why even though Microsoft, for example, gets called out for, you know, no headless, no headless semantics and a lack of consistency and very bad governance, they're still by far the market leader because the center of gravity hasn't hasn't shifted yet towards this set of capabilities. Yeah, but it's starting to, as we saw with the uh, arrows from earlier, exactly. all the leaders just moved down just a little bit. And just if, a little bit. And if th that sort of stuff is uh, going to accelerate, then we can predict that it'll move down further. Absolutely. Um, Kate Kate Tickner says here, govern self-service is the balance to strike, 100%, 100%. And I think the tooling is evolving to make that a much more achievable goal than it was in the past um, with uh, with kind of the older generation of BI tools. Okay, NLG and NLQ. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Eric. No, I, I was just going to say um, NLG and NLQ. Um, from my experience, and I, we did a, I know some people had brought up uh, Amazon QuickSight earlier, and I did a deep review, but part of it was their key with the querying language. And in my experience, um, all to, like all these BI tools for the most part, the natural language querying and processing, it's kind of, um, I don't want to call it a gimmick because I mean, it is useful for what it is, but it's not, it's not a differentiator in my opinion. You know, I don't think, and not right now, NLQ isn't going to make a big difference. Now, I mean, obviously there's some uh, things changing in the market as far as natural language processing and large language models that may change that as these tools get integrated. Yes. But as things are right now, as the integrations exist in the tools that exist today and a lot of these integrations have existed for what five years plus mm -hmm. going back to you know watson um right they're just kind of all right you know i wouldn't call them a game changer they're just kind of all right that's my experience with them too some are better than others i like q obviously thought spot has done the most with this and that that's yeah. a, a cool tool that has you know has met some success in the market although not I mean, they're neat these these things are neat but yes. like neat how far does neat get you yeah. And I, and I fundamentally like this has been a big thing that Gartner has been pushing. And I would say it just hasn't come to pass so far. The technology just hasn't been there to make it really that useful. Um, everyone's implementation of it is some degree of not that great. Now, all these bullet points here, uh, you, you see a big thing. I, and this is kind of this is the Super Data Brothers take on where this is headed is large language models are going to totally upend this. Just completely, right? Your quick site cues, your thought spots, your Tableau ask datas, your, you know, whatever Microsoft calls it, your Watson integration into Cognos, all that sort of stuff. It's gonna be completely upended by this. And actually, I think that where large language models and Chad GPT are gonna be most useful today is for the open data ops, data as code based platforms that have you know, APIs for everything and declarative APIs, yep. because, because imagine the degree of like the, the developer productivity enhancement, when you can work with the large language model to build out the code for a whole new ABI environment build out where you can describe the environment you want to the large language model, and it will give you the code to create it. Yeah, like, that, like give you give you the inf like, give you the code for the in infrastructure. Yes. The hardware infrastructure and the software infrastructure. Hundred percent. That's exactly it. That's what I'm talking about. Like this, this is going to be a radical productivity enhancement for BI teams who are using open, composable analytics as code-based platforms. That's where I think the greatest, the the near-term biggest benefits is going to come into play when when we start to talk about you know natural language capabilities and large language models, not the large language model being able to create visualizations for you. Because we've yeah. already had that capability in the BI tools, and then, and for the most part, yeah. it hasn't been that useful yeah. in our opinion. But right, but but as an enhancement for your developers, now you got to have a platform that has this. So in again, this is not this is like not Gartner. This is our, our yeah. take well, on well, this Gartner. Is, this is our take how things are how things are going to go. Yep. 
um, is that, you know, like good data, which has this DevOps based approach, SciSense, according to the report, has has really embraced analytics as code in the underlying platform. The the large language model approach will be a supercharger for you professional BI developers who are using a platform that is code based. Yep. Hundred percent. Like even uh using 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 chat GPT for like just personal scripting and side projects, right? It's like something that would take me a day takes me two hours. Right. Right. And like now imagine that with your entire BI infrastructure. You still as it stands right now and probably in the near future, you still need the expert in the middle, right? To use the large language model. But yeah. 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 And this is this kind of like, actually, this, this is Simon's point here. This would only be possible if all the data is provided for training and who wants their enterprise sensitive data to train NLQ. That's 100% correct. And that's why mm-hmm. I say with a code based BI platform, you don't it, you don't actually have to feed in any data, right? You can let the large language model generate the platform code for you mm-hmm. and not train it on the data. Because these large language models, I mean, we've, if you've played around with them, you know that when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, um, when it comes to like it doing computational stuff, like it will do them. It just does the math wrong. It's very it does, weird. It'll do multiplication wrong. Yeah, it just screws up all the time. So what? What in the near term? I think the long term it will do all those things. But in the near term, as a force multiplier for you as a developer, it's very useful. And then in that case. You have to have a BI platform that is code based where the large language model can partner with you to rapidly generate the code. But what I'm not talking about is the large language model being a user facing query tool at this no. point. No, because the user users can't trust that the model's not lying to them. Exactly. But an expert can tell if it's lying to them. Exactly. And this is this kind of gets to like Brent, Brent, you know, this kind of supports what we're talking about here. One of the huge benefits of the data ops approach is you're able to automate testing, which leads to much higher BI viz quality and accelerated analytics product to analyst productivity. 100% Brent. Okay. So there's this other piece, um, action frameworks, triggers and app builders. There's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting this, this, this is an interesting set of capabilities that as I was reading through the report, so let's just talk about what these are that, that Gartner calls out. Action frameworks is the ability for the BI tool to like do stuff, not just show stuff, okay? Um, and it's the ability for, for either developers or end users in a self-service way to set that up. So like you set up you know, the ability for the BI tool to take actions or triggers um, and then and then also app builders, the ability to create not just dashboards, but applications. And as I was reading through the report and I was looking at this feature set, it occurred to me, I was like, are all these just the standard report? Is this like the new iteration of the standard report? And I actually thought about it and I came away with the conclusion that I kind of think yes, insofar as a lot of these tools these feature sets in in these bi tools give you the ability to create a non-dashboard front end something that's a little more pixel perfect like like domo for example has this self-service app builder and i was just i haven't used it but i was i learned about it from the magic quadrant and then i was watching some of their videos on it and it you know it is much more like a traditional pixel perfect report builder in that the form factor is not just a dashboard and you have a lot of formatting control and that sort of thing that you might not have in um, in a lot of dashboarding environments where it's really focused on just cramming charts into a screen. Um, and then I started thinking again, like maybe this is the form factor of the 2020s is is more the analytics app where you go in and yes, you see charts, but you also can take actions. And so Gartner is really sees this as an area where um, it is an area of, of focus for tools and a differentiator going forward. Tools that add the ability to do stuff. Yep. I mean, how, how many times uh, any, any BI developers here have been made of something and asked, well, can this do right back? Right. <laughs> yeah, well, because right. you, you you give the end user this dashboard that gives them all the information they need, but then like the actual next step is them for them to update the information. Yeah. And, and there's no two... 
Yeah. There's been there has so thus far there's been no like easy integration of like well of course you get the edit button and then you edit it you right. know and, and it and updates that's what the, the data that's what these feature sets offer is like right back to databases or and this is the other key thing the modern trigger if you go back to the Cognos business object days what was triggered was like emails and PDF distributions what we're mm -hmm. talking about here is often um, SaaS you know app to app integrations that trigger things so like you might be. Um, you might be in uh, a um, in the BI tool, and from the BI tool, you can trigger an action in Salesforce or in HubSpot or you know in uh, whatever whatever app you're using, or vice versa. That's where the composability piece of this comes in. Composability, and I think BI people don't know this term yet, but it, it, it's all over the Gartner report, and you're going to have to learn it. Is the ability to is the ability to break your BI capability down into pieces and then provide those pieces, combine them within the BI tool or in other apps to provide certain functionality, okay? So that would be, can you easily embed components of BI in those other apps? And so these two, these capabilities all come together into um, a set of, of capabilities that I think really broaden the usefulness of BI applications way beyond dashboards and give you the ability to do stuff that is going to be key a key differentiator for bi apps in the future um bi, BI platforms in the future is the ability to do stuff take actions not just mm -hmm. see stuff and so the winners that i pulled out of the report from this were domo oracle good data tipco microstrategy and microsoft all got specific call outs for their ability to do some or all of what i'm talking about here I see the chat is just like popping off on GPT. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe we should topic. just do an episode where we just talk about GPT and BI. Well, yeah, what is what well, yeah, what is what do large language models mean for BI and analytics? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that'd be a good one. And hey, if, if that's a great suggestion. If anyone else has any any other suggestions for topics, feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah. There's always plenty to discuss. So, um a commu the community shout out. This is, those, we won't belabor the point on this. I appreciated that the Gartner report specifically called out strong community and community building efforts as mm -hmm. something that is a differentiator for BI platforms and that they do get credit for. I think yeah. this is very important. It's increasingly important going forward. Um, tools with strong communities have growth and expertise advantages like Tableau. Yeah. Tableau is its community. Yeah. Um, and the franchise model that Gartner talks about, it requires a great community, a place to go to get tutorials, to learn the tool. People, when they feel like they're a part of something, they're motivated to learn. And if you're trying to set up this franchise model, this hub and spoke, this data mesh, having a great community that people feel they can be a part of it should be something you consider for your tooling. Um, the winners called out for this were Tableau, a Alibaba, and Pyramid one of our big gainers this year. Um, I saw some hype for Pyramid in the chat earlier. Huh. Yeah, th yeah, there definitely was. I wonder um, my, how I gauge community a lot of times is I just find out how big the subreddit is. On yeah, <laughs> yeah. So like Tableau is huge, Power BI huge. Uh, Quick Sites was dead until I took it over. Now there's people posting again. Right. Um, <laughs> I wonder like how big the community for Alibaba and, and Pyramid are. Well, so Alibaba and like a Pyramid, um, I don't think I think the report called out pyramid for like really strong community building efforts, not that the oh, community gotcha. itself is giant, but that they they really put a premium on it. Um, gotcha. Alibaba did uh, something really interesting. I think it was Alibaba where they um, they actually gave you uh, um, they give people licensing discounts for when their employees achieve certifications which I thought was very, I'd never heard of that before. And I thought was actually a very good that, that's kind business of smart. practice. It's really smart. That's smart. It's super smart. So Alibaba, we don't have a lot of here in North America, but um, you know, they're obviously huge in the Chinese market. And, um, and, I, and I just thought that was so neat. Um, uh, SciSense, AWS and Tipco got called out for poor communities. Like you said, I mean, the QuickSight community is like, yeah, it's not it was, good. It, it, it had been um it had been dead for about two years with the dead moderator and like when yeah. I was doing my research for my uh, quick site deep dive which is on the channel by the way if you want to check that out um, and see some of these features we're talking about um, I had to apply like at message to admins be like hey can I take over this subreddit and I did so now that people are posting again yeah so here uh, 
Here's our market prediction time. Are you ready? And then after this, we'll do a couple vendor deep dives and give away a shirt. So mm -hmm. market prediction time. Composability, semantics, and data ops will be the key distinguishing features for the data platform of the future, especially if you want to be cloud independent. So, you know, if you're going to want to survive this shakeup that's coming to the market and want to be a big player who, who's not AWS, Microsoft, or Google, and not Oracle, I think these are where you're going to be investing. Um, what this allows you to do is high quality metrics to any app, not just your own BI front end, but uh, through software dev, right? Through your SDKs and your APIs into data science and and to uh, competitors. Like, yeah. like if, you know, your semantic Tableau's layer- Tableau's not going away. Right, you know? your semantic layer drives Tableau dashboards, great. Um, the ability to integrate ABI platform components in a composable or modular way running on any any data center people who want to avoid vendor lock-in or cloud provider lock-in mm -hmm. right you this means that you need to be containerized you need to run in kubernetes right you need to use devops practices yep. versus kind of running on vms and that sort of thing and then analytics as code plus gpt is a game changer so we just this is what we see this first vendors will be faltering in the coming years it's just it's going to become the commod and a very important feature but commoditized, not differentiating. The ability to serve the business analyst with drag and drop viz building is not going to make you a leader in the in the magic quadrant going forward. And I think will not be a distinguishing feature for BI platforms. I would not, you know, you'll have to have it, but it, it won't set you apart. BI teams that focus on churning out dashboards are in trouble. If that's how you think, if that's how you're architected. You're in the same position that a Cognos team was on in in 2015, right? Um, and then like, um, this is just a real talk point. Is Microsoft doing to BI what they did to Office apps? Like, their just market momentum is huge. Their pricing power is insane. My, I'm just, I do, I really hope that that we can maintain a strong independent BI platform vendor outside of the cloud providers and especially outside of Microsoft. Yeah. But I, I know that Microsoft just has huge market momentum and pricing power in this market. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's all all doom and gloom because um, they do have the huge like buy in power. But the flip side is that you also have to use Power BI. Right. Like <laughs> right. The flip side of, of using Power BI is using Power BI. It's not terrible, but it is it does have its quirks and any any installation of a BI tool over time requires technical debt. And I guarantee you there are people, companies out there that are so sick of Power BI and all these dashboards they have and all yes. these uh, custom models for each dashboard. And they're just thinking, how can I get out of this? Right. So I I, there were, I don't think it's, oh, it's not going to be a Microsoft Word situation. Definitely not. Right. But I mean, will, will Power BI continue to be like the market leader? I think yes. Yeah. And I, and I honestly think Microsoft is in a position too where like they can... You know they don't have to lead on any of this stuff like they no. didn't lead with with desktop based bi tools they don't they can see what happens and then use they they're they're very talented software dev mm -hmm. and engineering and product teams they can yep. see where the market goes and then adjust to it to maintain yep. their position yep now, like, what, what's a, yeah what's a better tool teams or slack slack right <laughs> but, but what, what what do most people use teams uh-huh so I know people want us to talk about the tools and uh, yep. we'll we'll go through a few of them. Um, I only want to talk about the new kid on the block, good data, okay? What's the good thing about good data? The headless semantic layer is very powerful. The analytics is code approach, DevOps approach, composability pioneers is the term Gartner uses for them. If you're interested in that sort of thing, and this is where I think there's huge, um, a, a huge advantage to taking the headless analytics as code approach. I, I fundamentally believe in it. Good data, this is what the, the platform is built from the ground up for. It's very intriguing. What's bad? Well, they got lower scores for most the, on most traditional ABI platform capabilities. That is like, how good are their dashboards? How good is the Viz Builder, right? That sort of stuff. Um, and you need to embrace the good data way to succeed with good data. But I think if you do, you can run really far, really fast. Now you see I have a disclaimer on here. Good Data is one of our clients at Super Data Brothers. So yep. we, we should be upfront about that. We work with Good Data in a professional capacity um, uh, as, as advisors to them on, on their uh, platform. So um, keep that in mind. 
But why are we talking about them here up front? It's because they're the new tool yeah. on, on the Magic Quadrant. IBM, the old standby. I know a lot of you here know me from as the car as a Cognos guru, um, and so we, we got to talk about IBM here. The good that Gartner calls out IBM for is they address like with Cognos plus planning analytics, they address almost every use case. They're very comprehensive. You everything that Gartner says is important. You can do with IBM IBM's offerings. They have this new analytics content hub, which is pretty neat. Um, because you can, in a single pane of glass, you can combine like a Cognos dashboard and a Tableau dashboard, like in one place. Um, and you can deploy anywhere. So you're not, there's no lock in with IBM. Now, the bad is that Gartner calls out low market awareness and momentum. And the other thing, I mean, I'm just going to throw this out there. You know, when you read the blurb on IBM, like they spend, they take 33 words when they're summarizing, like, what did IBM do this year? They spend 33 words describing, Microsoft Teams integration as a standout feature of 2022 for IBM. Yeah. That's just I mean, not enough. This market is no. moving so fast, right? 33 words to say Teams integration. Um, yeah. I, you know, I found that disheartening. Um, yeah, something that I never actually found useful in my professional life anyway. <laughs> no. And that's one thing, you know, we didn't really harp on it, but I would say... The, like Gartner says collaboration is very important, but I think collab like collaboration has so far to go beyond uh, beyond um, like the ability to send a chart to Slack. I mean, that is like, give me a break. That's why, you know, many of you know, I, I spent about a year at a startup called Count that makes a collaborative data canvas, which is like a real time really cool. data builder where five people can be in there writing SQL, building visualizations, laying out dashboards in real time together. Like that is data collaboration, okay? Mm -hmm. Not sending stuff to teams. Get off my high horse there. Pyramid. <laughs> um, this is the one uh, the that gets a lot of love you know, the big movement this year, they added spreadsheet like functionality. So this is a big trend. I think you'll see spreadsheet capabilities coming to BI tools. Sigma computing is in on the, the report this year, but uh, you know, has been making a lot of movement in the market. I think with a Excel like BI interface, it's very cool. Um, what Sigma really got called out for is like this end to end end user focus where you can do data prep, modeling, discovery and deployment as a business person. They have great business person facing tools to allow you to do all of this great stuff. And I think that's why they 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 took such a huge leap. Um, really strong self service across the whole stack, not just self service viz. Okay. The bad that Gartner called them out for was the lack of market awareness and also weak developer focused tools. So while they're great for the end user, if you're a developer, they're um, they're not as strong uh, for you know for the, that developer uh, facing features. The last two we'll talk about them quick. Um, Salesforce, I call them leader for now. What do they get called out for? See again, this is I think you're going to see a this is where the big shift is going to happen when when we get this market shake up. I'm telling you, the good that they say about Tableau is the community rocks. And it's sort of independent, right? Like it's not one of the big platform vendors, so they don't have to, you know, they're not trying to push you on to, to their cloud spend. And also people really like Tableau. Like it just has a good, people like it. The people who like it really like it. What do they say is bad about it? Gartner calls out slowing market momentum, worsening support, a Salesforce centric roadmap that doesn't address the needs of the general analytics community. It's not great for a market leader, okay? So um, I think, you know, this is where you're gonna see a shakeup, this is prediction time. And anecdotally, I hear a lot of complaints about Tableau lately, that people feel the UI is, is clunky, it's outdated, that sort of thing. Um, now I'm not a Tableau power user, I'm not a Tableau expert, you know, I've, I can use it, but I'm, you know, by no means am I, so I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not telling you that it's clunky, I'm telling you I'm hearing that it's clunky. Um, and then, the, you know, Microsoft's still the king, right? Align, alignment across, what does Gartner say? The alignment just between Power BI and all the other stuff Microsoft does is a huge strength. It's cheap. And they have a big product vision with Power Automate, Power Apps. Like, Microsoft has a big BI vision. Um, they call them out the lack of governance and semantics. is just, like, really weak for Microsoft. 
They're locked in architecture, no headless vision, and you're only on Azure, our, our weaknesses. And so I think, again, as the center of gravity shifts towards DevOps, data ops, analytics as code, governance, headless semantics, data collaboration, some of these things Microsoft does well, like collaboration, I think, and, and the you know, composability and the integration with applications, as long as you're all in on Microsoft, Microsoft does very well. But, you know, lack of headlessness, very poor governance. If those truly become important differentiators on the Magic Quadrant, what does that say for Microsoft's positioning? They're going to have to add these feature sets if they want to maintain a leadership position. Okay. Um, whew. That was, we, that was a whirlwind hour there. Um, yeah. And so, if, you, if you guys want to talk about other stuff, and I see we've got tons of comments that we can talk about, we can go a little bit over. That'd be fine. But I yeah. think while you're getting your questions in um, and for discussion topics, I think it's T-shirt time. It's T-shirt time. Yeah. So um, what other tools? I, I read the whole report, and I have notes for every single tool. So if there's a tool you want me to talk about, um, let me know. But first, it is T-shirt time. Okay? So. Mm -hmm. So if you, okay, okay, just a reminder, if you're watching, you need to go to YouTube to win the t-shirt, okay? Mm -hmm. You need to go to YouTube and type into the comments, hashtag Super Data Brothers to be entered into the t-shirt giveaway. You cannot yep. wa win the t-shirt if you're watching on LinkedIn. Um, so we'll give you uh, just a little, a second to do that. So overall, my, my takeaway from, from this year's Magic Quadrant though, you know, especially people who have been following me for a while know that I, I've written some pretty spicy takes on the MQ in the past, um, where yeah. I, uh, you know, I was 2016, very 2016 was, was very <laughs> yeah. critical. Yeah. And well, I mean, it seems like what they're talking about, they might be rolling back some of the focus from 2016. And, and that's really what I'm saying is like Gardner's vision and my vision are in stronger alignment than they have been in in seven or eight years, honestly. And so, you know, I really believe that I understand why we went to the, you know, we're going to be churning out dashboards uh, and Viz is all yeah. that matters. And it's about speed and agility. There was a lot of value to be gained for that. Yeah. But it, we're it, at the it was end. a game changer to do that, but we're, we've, we've squeezed, uh, we've squeezed all the juice out of that lemon, you know? Exactly. And so I, you know, we're, we're heading in a, um, a new direction here. And so, mm -hmm. with that said, let me go ahead and uh, popcorn for the MQ 2024. Absolutely. All right. So, let me just um, share my screen here. Here we go. This is your last chance. 25 entries, man. It's a big, big entry it, pool. And we got, we're off. All right. Who is going to win the shirt? The coveted Super Data Brothers shirt. Kate Tickner. Kate. Kate, yeah, I saw some of your comments in the chat, Kate. So yeah, thank you for engaging and for, for the good comments. All right, so Kate, what you're going to need to do is um, go ahead and reach out to me directly. You can get a hold of me at Ryan at SuperDataBrothers.com and give me your address and your size. Um, it's North yep. American sizes. We do ship internationally, so um, let me know, Kate, if yeah. you're still here. Uh, your size and where you would like this shirt sent. And um, I will also try to reach out to you on LinkedIn if I don't hear from you, okay? Yep. And then uh, while you've got the uh, email up, um, I think it's, I think we should do maybe a quick plug. So uh, you, as, you see, as you've seen through this uh, little webinar, web show, podcast, whatever we're calling it these days, uh, mm -hmm. us, the Super Data Brothers, now we do these types of analysis of the market, of tools, but we also have the uh, the technical capabilities if you need help implementing. So if you need help advising of the BI market, maybe you're picking a new tool, or maybe you just need help uh, revamping your uh, BI practice, or even just implementing some new uh, suite of reports or a new uh, data pipeline, you can go ahead and feel free to reach out, ryan at superdatabrothers.com, and we can talk. Absolutely. Um, all, right. all right. So. Hold on. Let's see, do you have any, any more comments before? Well, someone asked, uh, okay, so Click, what did I write about Click? Um, I'm Click if you're still sticking around for a bit. Okay. Let's see what else so, we got. Um, 
yeah, so my my take on click overall, um, I think that so looking at so one thing like overall, I I will say I don't run into click a ton out there. Um and and I I know that they, you know, they were historically a European company and so they have a bigger f- footprint in Europe than they do in North America, which is part of the reason why I don't see a whole lot of click out and about. Um I think that so overall I think that what click is doing is very smart in that they are I think click probably recognizes the changing of the of like the change that's coming to the marketplace you know with some of the um some of the acquisitions that they've done lately like they're trying to get into be more of a full stack provider and not just a viz front end provider if you look at what click did click had a much you know kind of the the original click view with cube based and that sort of thing from the cognos business objects days um had kind of a metrics layer built into it. Obviously not the type of open headless thing, you know, API based thing that we're talking about now. Um, but then they came out with ClickSense, which was the response to the move to the Viz era uh, and and that sort of thing. And now Click is trying to add more full state cap- stack capabilities, which I think is, is smart. Um, they get called out for in the report for their uh, open API and application automation. So the composability piece which again, I, I think is gonna be a key component moving forward that you're gonna to have to have if you wanna be a broadly used independent BI platform. You have to have strong APIs um, and, and composability. And so seeing that in the report, I think was, was a big strength of Click. Um, overall though, you know, what I see, uh, I think that Click is going to have to I, I I just have a feeling that they're gonna have a hard time maintaining their position in the leaders quadrant as this shakeout happens. And I and I think it's just um the, honestly the only person I think is gonna stay in the leaders quadrant after the shakeout is going to be Microsoft, to be honest with you. And I just think that um the changes coming to the market are are gonna be significant and that Microsoft is the only one who's going to be able to pivot to maintain it. And so overall, yeah. my take on Click is like, I see what they're doing. I like it overall. I'm not confident that they're going to be able to maintain their position as a leader. Um, I think that that the, uh, the Click clients I do know have had a lot of heartburn over the Click View, Click Sense transition. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, but I do like, you know, what Gartner calls them out for composability and APIs. I think that's the way things are going. So as long as they lean into that, I think they'll, they will maintain, be able to maintain some degree of, um, uh, uh, of adaptability to the market changes, but that, that's my overall feeling on click. And again, I, I don't run into click a ton, so I can't, I can't, you know, tell you, well, wh- my experiencing with click is blank, right? Cause I just haven't used them that much. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, one quick reminder, um, if you're watching on YouTube, you always got to oh, give, yeah. give the shout out to get people to make sure to like and subscribe, all right? And then leave a comment if you want to, even a nasty comment if you disagree with us. All, all engagement, all engagement is good. Yeah. So, like and subscribe if you like and you want to see more. Um, we do every Thursday at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and then I have um, a few questions I that people brought up that I want to talk about real quick. Um, okay. So, Mike talking about which site spent time doing reporting. Remember Gartner backed away from waiting on that, still a huge market. Yeah. So Amazon QuickSite, um, definitely still a pretty big market and got some other questions. AWS does BI. I thought of them as serving data to be consumed by deep BI tools. Now they in fact do do BI, uh, Amazon QuickSite, and it's completely integrated into their um, cloud platform. So you can build stuff in Redshift and do the reporting on in QuickSight. And actually, I think what last week, or maybe two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, actually, we actually did a deep dive on this channel about Amazon QuickSight going into like what it's good for, what it's bad for. Um, the reporting interface is pretty nice and and, and consciously designed. Um, they have enterprise reporting features. They have Q, which is, you know, which is their natural query languages, which you know, we're not super hyped on, but it was neat to use it. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about QuickSight and what it can do and what it can't do. We did a full analysis. 
yeah. um, on our YouTube channel. And I should be, yep, I put that in the comments right there. So if you want to look into QuickSight, you can check out that and we kind of do a deep dive on that. Yeah, yeah. And um, if there are tools you want us to do a deep technical dive on, let us know. Like we're happy yeah. to do it. We just need to know what people want to see. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, it's, it's, I, a, yeah. it, it's a little easier with, uh, with the kind of the startup level tools, they're usually really eager to engage with us, whereas some mm -hmm. tools are like locked, you know, the big old tools are oftentimes locked behind trials yeah. and stuff like that. But let us know what you want to see and we'll do it. Yeah. Yep. And then, yeah. So Ryan's kind of more the the talking business fella. And like I do more of the technical deep dives. Yeah, definitely. You can tell by our haircuts. <laughs> yes, you can. But <laughs> My full wild hair. Uh huh. All right. Well, it looks like um, uh, it looks like that's that's going to be it for today. So um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for attending. Yep. This yep. was an awesome show. What a great audience today! Unbelievable. This is, this is incredible. The turnout was awesome. Yeah. And like so your thank, comments were great. Like total fire. Go you. Yeah. Um, yep. So yeah, this is uh, this was this has been awesome. Uh, we will we will continue to do these shows. So you let us know what side of, sort of content you want to see, and we yep. will make it happen. Yep. And this was a Tuesday. This was a special one because we wanted to get this Gartner commentary in. But normally it's every Thursday at noon. Yep. Right. So Thursday at noon. Turn every Thursday at noon. We'll be live, and you can check us out. Absolutely. All right. So um, until next time, take care, everybody. We are the Super All Data right. Brothers. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.